We've identified a new asbestos-related disease, and we're figuring out ways to avoid but it. Her story lives on in each and every one of you. Firefighters that have lost their lives, that have really put everything on the line. Thank you very much, and thank you to the ADAO and, uh, organizers, Linda, for the invitation. What I'm going to do is use the next 15 minutes to try and give you an overview of uh, kind of where we've come in the last decade or so, briefly, um, where we are in terms of new developments in cancer research and how this may uh, significantly impact um, outcomes for patients with malignant pleural mesothelioma. So I'll state some disclosures. We can't work without the pharma industry, and we work them very closely. And I will be talking about some of the agents that we've engaged with some of these companies uh, in previous discussions. So let me first of all start with the challenge and the research prioritization. You know, um, when we look at the UK, just as one example of a country in which mesothelioma is clearly a major problem, what we see is an upward swing in the numbers of patients being diagnosed with this terrible malignancy. This is something that's been recognized by the government in the UK. And indeed, very recently, a um, survey, national survey, was conducted for research priorities. This will be published in full, but in essence, this is a, a prioritization um, strategy that took in really the opinions of scientists, doctors, carers, patients, people around the UK to provide us with a ranking essentially, of where we felt the most important research priorities were. And this is something that's being used by the funding agencies within the UK to now drive forward research um, based on those prioritizations. This is the James Lind Alliance, which you can see here on the left. In the UK, we have a large number of trials. And in fact, I just want to say that historically, uh, we are at a place we've never been before. There are more trials for patients with mesothelioma than we've ever seen. There are more coming, and I want to basically illuminate, I think, on some of the areas um, that we're exploring. And this is just a little graph here showing the UK covered in trials um, currently, uh, randomized studies in particular, some of which have been developed uh, within the UK. So I'm going to talk about drugs. I'm not a surgeon. I'm not a radiotherapist. Uh, I deal with systemic therapies. And systemic therapies for mesothelioma are not the most effective. I think all of us will be very aware of this. The only approved therapy we have at the present time for mesothelioma is from a clinical trial, a randomized trial known as Emphasis, that was published in 2003. So this is over a decade ago. And you can see here, actually, on the left, in gray, Pemetrex combined with platinum, cisplatin in this instance, uh, was associated with an improvement in survival, an improvement to what then was 12.4 months. When we talk to a patient about standard chemotherapy, that's the figure we use, 12.4 months, based on the randomized controlled evidence that we have from the emphasis study. We know that um, raltatrexed, a very similar drug to pemetrexed, an antifolate, achieves a very similar increment in overall survival. So based on randomized evidence, the best quality of evidence we have at the moment, there is only one treatment. What we need to do, of course, is move beyond that. So I'm going to talk about what are called empirical approaches, taking what we know works, and adding something to that. This is the strategy that's um, been used in the past. It may not be the most effective way of you know, efficiently moving forward with developments, but it is a sensible way. If we know a drug may have activity, drug X, by adding it to standard treatment, we may have the opportunity to see some synergy. And therefore, this is a, a very busy area now for investigators in the field of mesothelioma. The classes of drugs that are being explored in combination with chemotherapy in this so-called triplet approach are vast, and they cover different areas. We're exploring um, a very novel approach using heat shock protein 90, for example, as a target. But there are many others, some of which are vaccine-related, for example, in which the idea is we can combine and um, uh, enhance the activity of already effective chemotherapy. What's important is a lot of these studies are randomized. And randomized trials, this is an area that we've lacked, I think, in mesothelioma research in the past. It's through only through randomization that we can actually establish whether there's an incremental improvement upon the standard of care. And this is, um, this is the, the approach that is being adopted. Although, with newer treatments, some of which I'll tell you about, it is conceivable that if big increments are seen in uh, patient benefit, the, the randomization process 
may even become questionable if you're way beyond um, what's been seen before, particularly in the setting where there's no standard of care. And we know regulatory agencies are looking at this sort of approach for approvals. So this is the uh, so-called empirical triplet. Now, the problem, of course, is that with only one uh, approved treatment, what happens afterwards? And this is, of course, what patients see when they've completed standard of therapy and there's nothing else, um, really there's a, a precipice uh, ahead. We've had some attempts to uh, identify new therapies for patients after first-line therapy, um, one of which has just been recently published. This is a drug called Varinostat. It appeared very promising, actually, in very early studies. But this was the largest study undertaken um, in second-line setting, and unfortunately, it was robustly negative. I would argue that one of the reasons this is the case is that this is a drug that targets a specific protein within patients with mesothelioma, and the trial itself was designed not to identify individuals likely to benefit, but was an, a, a drug that was used in everybody. And of course, when you treat a drug that's targeted in everybody, what you're doing is diluting out the effects that may be extremely beneficial in a minority of individuals. And this brings me on to my last bit, which alludes to exactly what I've just said. We know that for any drug, even the most effective drugs, they only work in a minority of individuals, or a proportion at least. And the approach that we are now using, particularly in lung cancer, where this has been incredibly successful, is to identify those individuals who are likely to benefit to a particular drug. Now this takes into account the fact that we are all different. When we look at a population of patients with mesothelioma, they are not the same, although we call it one disease. The genetics differ significantly between um, individual patients, and those genetics can really influence how drugs work. As I said, lung cancer has been a fantastic exemplar for this, and we can see that when we look at even lung adenocarcinoma, one proportion of overall lung cancers, this is a very complex population with multiple subtypes of disease that are defined by what we call driver oncogenes, cancer-causing genes. They're a little bit like engines, you know, in a car. These engines, of course, if you pull the key out of an engine, the car stops. If you target some of these engines of the cancer, you can stop the cancer in its tracks and create some really very spectacular effects. And so this has been the development of lung cancer recently where we're seeing a complication in how we treat patients, first identifying likely responders and then treating with appropriate um, uh, drugs. Of course, for mesothelioma, we're still stuck in this so-called empirical era, which I've just shown you. Let me just go back. So for mesothelioma, we're still really where we were 10 years ago, uh, officially. If you look at um, the sort of position that lung cancer shifted into, this so-called targeted era, where we're now looking at genes to predict sensitivities, we're just about entering this era, I think, for patients with mesothelioma. And I'll just give you some examples of why that's the case. So mesothelioma, like all other cancers, are essentially uh, diseases that have been associated with alterations in the genes, in the genome. And these are caused, of course, by asbestos. We're beginning to get an understanding of those genes that are altered in mesothelioma. And these are illustrated here. You can see some are very common. These are all patients with a particular mutation, and some are less common. What's key is that these mutations now provide us with a potential opportunity to treat the cancer much more effectively, much as we've seen in lung cancer, melanoma, breast cancer. And so the key now is to find ways of effectively dealing with these specific mutational subtypes. I'll give you some examples. If we take the mutation NF2, this encodes a protein called Merlin. Now, NF2 is a mutation that we see somewhere in around about half of patients with mesothelioma. This is actually very good indeed. If you look at lung cancers, some of the actionable, what we call actionable mutations, occur maybe only 1% of the time. Here we're dealing with a mutation that's occurring 50% of the time. Now, we know that there are some drugs, one of which is called a focal adhesion kinase inhibitor, which can target the NF2 mutant mesotheliomas more effectively. And so we have a big trial now, it's a global study that's enrolling, should finish enrolling this year, in which patients receiving chemotherapy who benefit by having their cancer stabilized will then go on to receive a novel agent, in this case a drug called defectinib, a FAC inhibitor or a focal adhesion kinase inhibitor, and patients will be ex examined 
who have either the mutation or don't have the mutation, the hope is, based on preclinical data, quite extensive preclinical data, that those individuals with the mutation will have a better chance of responding. So this is using genetics to help us, uh, to guide us with more effective therapy, and it's happening now uh, in patients with mesothelioma. Another example of this approach is one which was published um, uh, last year in ASCO, and this is for patients who have had um, evidence of loss of a particular protein, this case called AS. Loss of this protein confers sensitivity to a drug. We can identify those individuals and we can treat them effectively. And when we do this, uh, we found what is certainly the only case that I've seen in the literature of a response, a response where the duration by which the cancer was controlled was almost doubled. This was the um, uh, hazard ratio 0.53. It was significant. And this was for what I would describe as the first uh, targeted therapy for mesothelioma. So we're hoping now that by taking this into a combination study in a specifically genetically defined subgroup with chemotherapy as a triplet, but using this in this genetically defined subgroup, we can see improvements in overall outcome. I have to say, as my final point, that um, there are many other developments um, ongoing in the development of, of, of true treatments for mesothelioma. Perhaps the most important may be, as we're seeing in other cancers, the development of immunotherapy. Tomorrow at the uh, AACR conference in the US, there will be presented a uh, plenary presentation, late-breaking abstract, um, for a drug formerly called MK3475, or now um, Keytruda, and this is a drug that may have significant activity in mesothelioma. We'll see tomorrow when the data's announced. But we have seen this already, record um, breaking speeds to uh, approvals in other diseases. Um, and there are other approaches of immunotherapy that may have benefit in mesothelioma. So I think this is a very exciting avenue that we'll, we'll see um, expand and I hope will bring benefit to patients with mesothelioma, not just lung cancers and other, other diseases. So I'll summarize. I think um, it's very clear that we have more clinical trials now for mesothelioma patients than we've ever had. Um, and that's fantastic. If I had to criticize the current state of affairs, it would be that these trials are predominantly focused on the first line setting. We know first line therapy works. What happens afterwards? We need to find more treatments for patients upon relapse effective therapies. We are moving from a period of empirical therapy. If one asks, well, why haven't we had a better treatment for mesothelioma? It's obvious. We can't develop treatments effectively as we know who is going to benefit by a treatment. And the use of genetics or other ways of identifying responders is the way forward. It's worked elsewhere. Why shouldn't it work for patients with mesothelioma? And so to reinforce that in my last point, I think targeted strategies identifying responding patients or patients likely to respond is the way in which we're going to, I think, uh, improve outcomes for this disease. And I, I really look forward to the next couple of years to see what changes happen. And I'm sure there will be lots of them. So thanks very much indeed. I'm sorry if I went over time. Thank you.